uh, thank you, President Jackson, uh, for making this happen. And thank you, Jackie uh, Conrad, for pulling it together as well. And thanks you all for coming out on uh, arguably the most miserable uh, cold night uh, that we've seen probably since, I don't know, February. Who knows? Um, uh, President Jackson mentioned community newspapers and how wonderful they are. I always say that it, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to have some really uh, uh, great jobs in journalism. None was better than when I was the editor of the Somerville Journal uh, before the internet uh, and when people had to read print. And, uh, and we were the only paper in town of a city of 75,000 and that was uh, the true epitome of power in a, in a place that had one fundamental news source and was very political. So I found that when I would go out um, to, uh, to various political events, it was always a very intense experience, which actually at one point I was slugged at a campaign party. So that's, uh, those were the days, let's just put it that way. Um, everything else seemed to be very, very mild uh, afterwards. So my plan tonight is to, uh, to make some broad observations about the Boston economy, uh, to talk about some hiring trends uh, that I think are important, and then I think for the uh, undergraduates and graduates who are looking for jobs in the audience, make um, a handful of career uh, suggestions, not career suggestions, but career search suggestions, if you will um, abide with me to, if we get there. Uh, because I do think that, interestingly, you can have some fantastic qualifications and you can do great classroom work. But if you don't have the right strategy to apply uh, and hunt, um, it, it diminishes, I think, uh, the, the impact of getting uh, all that important education. And I think it's an area that sometimes is overlooked. Um, but so my general broad observations about the economy in Boston come in the form of what I call paradoxes or contradictions. And uh, President Jackson has alluded to it a little uh, in her opening remarks, but paradox number one is that we have one of the best economies in the country, and yet we do not celebrate it or acknowledge that fact in any concerted, meaningful way. So um, it ends up being that most college students uh, tend to go through college without hardly any knowledge about where they are economically speaking. It's not that uh, I think there are a lot of instances where they um, have some great interactions, but in the aggregate, and I think there are exceptions, and I think Cambridge College is one of them, um, the college experience is um, not heavily connected to the local economy. And, and so here we have um, this remarkable economy, and yet not a lot of um, awareness about it. And so I talk about Boston's economy not just being one of the best, but I make the case that it is the best in the country. And why I do that is if you look at the various sectors that we have in Boston, uh, they rank one, two, or three in the country, arguably. Um, you start with biotech, we are um, undisputed biotech capital of the nation, if not the world. You talk about healthcare, um, we are the only region that has six teaching hospitals. The next one, it, next highest one is two. Um, we have, of course, the Longwood Medical Area, which is no place like it, even close to like it in the country. Um, you talk about startup formation um, and the startup ecosystem. We are a distant number two, uh, but we are, or three, depending on how you, how you look at it. New York has become on very strong in terms of VC venture capital funding, but we're right there. Um, medical devices is an area that people don't talk about, but we are the, the top area with Covidian, Boston Scientific, Phillips, 
We are the top medical device center in the country. Minnesota might make a claim, but we're right there. Um, asset management, again, we're back away from the big, big player like New York, but again, we are quite prominent. It's one of the major, major sectors here, uh, and I'd, you could argue that it's second. Uh, professional services, lawyers, accountants, management consultants, per capita, uh, next to Washington, D.C., <laughs> which is always number one per capita with lawyers, and New York, uh, then there's us. So we have that going. And then you just look around and something as nuts and bolts as construction activity. Um, we have never been through the kind of um, uh, construction process here, this kind of growth, this kind of, uh, this is unprecedented. And, uh, you know, in, so in aggregate, we have probably, when you add up all those, let's say they get awarded points um, sector by sector, you would have to put us number one. Um, but, so we're number one national economy, but that's a fact that's lost on most of our students. And that's really why I wrote the book. I wrote the book because after years and years at the BBJ of going out and visiting schools, guest lecturing, talking about the local economy, talking about uh, the model of the BBJ, which is, uh, really focuses on that small to mid-sized company, the growth of those companies and how businesses interact with each other, uh, I would talk and I just had a strong sense that there was just no um, general awareness about what was happening around them. I thought, that's strange. Anyway, so I started teaching a course at uh, Suffolk University about three years ago uh, on the Boston economy. And, uh, and then two years ago, as, as uh, President Jackson mentioned, I, I, uh, I mean, I, actually this year, I wrote the book. So paradox number two is we are loaded with almost drowning in college students. And yet, as President Jackson mentioned, we face a major college <coughs> degree shortage. And that is the most bizarre, quixotic thing that, that it's, it's hard to fathom. Why could that be? How is that possible? I mean, that's a riddle if there ever was one. How can we have 250,000 college students in the greater Boston area and still be a region that faces a college degree shortage, a significant one. Well, there's various factors. One is we are an older workforce, and so we are facing a bit of a retirement process. You could call it a crisis if you wanted to, but it's certainly coming. So we have that happening. Um, we uh, are slow population growth area. We don't grow our population very fast, unlike other parts of the country, like Texas, like Florida, where people come flying in, driving in, what have you, and it creates a tremendous amount of pressure in the workforce. We don't generally have that happening. So, um, and lastly, well, we get all these students, but we don't retain all of them for sure. And again, that is what it, why uh, to reemphasize what uh, President Jackson said, um, homegrown uh, college graduates uh, are the most precious you know, asset that we have, the people that are going to stay in this marketplace. Uh, another, um, another paradox about the local economy is that, uh, and, and about the region, is that we're wealthier than ever. We're richer than ever and yet we're just as poor as we've always been, if that makes sense. Like, and I'm trying to talk like, I'm not trying to talk like a Zen master, but I'm trying to, um, um, how can we, we be richer than ever and yet just as poor we, as we've ever been? Well, we have over 15,000 households in Massachusetts that have uh, incomes over a million dollars a year, and that's a record number. Um, this is in the 2014 tax year, uh, the most recent available. And, and yet we have, according to the Brookings Institution, the uh, widest income inequality gap in the country. And that's the way they do that number is basically the mean, the average of the top 5% in salaries over 
the average of the bottom 20% in salaries. And so that ratio is the, was the highest. I, I think it's, let's just, let's just say that we have a pretty wide income gap here. I think there are probably some other areas you might argue it's worse, but that number came out. Um, I think San Francisco's worse, but uh, whatever, New York may be worse, but all the same, it's bad here. Um, and so we have these 15,000 uh, households with over a million in income, and we have a poverty rate in Boston that hasn't moved in any meaningful way in the last 10 years at 21.6%, families in poverty, 21.6%. So we have all this wealth and yet all this poverty still, which is, again, troublesome. Um, another paradox is that we have become a more diverse, ever more diverse um, workforce um, ever more diverse population. And yet there isn't a single industry um, that I mentioned that uh, doesn't have um, a major issue um, or, or a significant diversity challenge. And this is less true, I think, in education and it's less true in healthcare, um, but it's se severely acute in technology, um, the life sciences, um, professional services, uh, where, uh, where there's, um, there's a lack of, of a reflection of the population in the workforce. So those are the handful of big, broad things. These uh, very much um, tremendous, uh, uh, tr a tremendous economy, um, but one that is limited, I think, by the number of people that we have uh, the lack of qualified workers, um, and it's one that we don't seem to be adequately sharing our wealth. Uh, statewide unemployment, the numbers now 2.9%, that came out today. Um, I always think of the state unemployment numbers being a little bit artificial. Let's look at the more meaningful number for us. What's the Boston area unemployment rate? The last number they had was 2.4%. And the number they don't give you is, what's the unemployment rate for those with a college degree? Anyone, I would imagine that it's probably close to 1%. So we are looking at, or maybe a, a fraction of a percent, we are looking at an economy of which we just haven't had uh, this kind of strength uh, in quite some time. And in fact, we are an economy that is just stretching at the seams in areas that we've just never seen it before. For example, uh, food services. So if people know Italy, uh, the, you know, the, um, who's the guy that does Italy? Mario Batali, is that the guy? Or am I yeah. making up a name? Um, Italy um, uh, op just opened uh, in uh, back bay in the Prudential Center. 600 workers, uh, where are they gonna get those workers for? There isn't enough, there were not 600 workers for them, uh, qualified workers for that they had to take from other people. And so you've got this competition where, you, where a company that size that wants to enter the market is struggling to do so. It's happening in construction as well as we build a casino in Everett. Um, I, the ultimate irony was that we passed this gambling casino law um, the main reason was the jobs. It was, that was the rationale. We want the jobs. We want the construction jobs. And here it is finally being built, and we don't have enough construction workers to do the, the work. It's kind of amazing. And so I was just with um, the head of the regional um, uh, commercial real estate group uh, the other day, David Begelfer, and he was like, oh, we, you know, the, the rates are going through the roof for construction workers. There's just not enough of them. So, um, so it's definitely a, um, an advantageous uh, economy for sure. Um, it, the, the supply and, uh, and demand uh, dynamic is great, I think, for the students um, and anyone with the qualifications. Um, if you're a biology major, um, 
a computer science major, a math major, like studying accounting, you can guarantee that you're going to have multiple offers. Um, and it's, uh, and I was just talking the other day to a guy who runs a, the Eliasing Group, which is a tech, um, uh, basically a tech placement firm and a temporary, um, temporary uh, employment firm for tech, but they, they do advanced high-end IT um, and high-end assignments. And he said, we're at negative employment in the, in the, in the tech space. Um, but my argument is, is that uh, a degree in almost anything, uh, I meant, I think, a degree in poetry, um, which again, back in my day, people would get degrees in poetry. I don't know if that happens anymore. Um, philosophy. I think it can lead to a good, um, a good job right out of school. Um, and I try to get to why I think that is in a little bit. So let me get to the hiring trends. So uh, traditionally, we think about uh, the, the workforce and you know, the job opportunities. We think about them in buckets. We think about the different sectors I mentioned, the um, you know, healthcare and retail and financial services, et cetera. And, and I, that's, those are obviously still useful categories, but they're less important than they used to be because they're really blending together more and more. And they're blending together more and more because um, the job skills are becoming more important than the actual industry that you're in. So you have, um, so a classic example is if you're good at um, if you're good at data, if, you, if you've got a degree in data analytics, or if you're good at math, or, you're, or you've got some IT experience, that's, that, those kinds of skills have no specific industry. They, they migrate across many different industries. And increasingly, it's becoming the case that if you're good at sales, it doesn't matter if you're good at sales in, um, you know, in in retail, or you're good at sales in in, in healthcare. Um, yeah, you they want to know that you that you're smart and you can adapt to the vocabulary. But um, but these jobs are bleeding across different industries. It's not, and they're competing with each other for the same people. So um, and it's ever more the case that people in biotech aren't looking just for scientists, but they're looking for IT people. They're looking at people that can crunch an incredible amount of data that they're getting now as everything gets digitized and as they, you know, and as they come up with um, an incredible new formulas for sorting through different genetic types and identifying diseases. That's a data function as much as it is a science function. So they're stealing people from, um, you know, from the high tech world, State Street, um, is looking to hire a thousand data scientists. Um, they're stealing from everybody. It's it's become one of these situations where again sector matters, but not as much as it used to. It's about job skills, and those are highly transferable. Um, another trend I think is that it's probably never been a better time to switch careers, and I say that simply because, well. The numbers: 2.9 um, percent, under 2.5 percent locally, 1 percent of your college degree. Well, what's going on? Well, increasingly, the hiring managers, faced with reality, desperately wanting to hold on to their required skill sets, but faced with the reality, they're broadening who they're looking for, they're broadening their criteria, and they're thinking about hiring people that they never would have hired otherwise. And this is, and this is innovation is, you know, um, uh, is coming from this necessity. What's the term? Um, but anyway, uh, so we are, um, what, is, what it's basically doing is um, forcing companies to look internally more and also to create their own training um, modules. And in the book, um, I mention Wayfair, which is again one of these very fast-growing companies in the Back Bay 
they're probably sending half of their employees to Italy to eat um, now that Italy's open. They're right there over the bridge, I think, uh, to go into Italy. Um, and um, Wayfair just, they, they needed engineers desperately, so they began to create their own internal institute to, um, uh, to recruit people who had the right kind of background. That right kind of background could be, you know, good at math, um, some kind of corresponding skill. So I do think um, it's easier now to switch careers and it's also easier to get that um, promotion or to, um, to angle for something that you might not ever otherwise have had. Um, another Boston uh, trend, very much so, is that the world is coming to us more than ever. So we are seeing the world gravitate, uh, meaning uh, internationally but also nationally. And of course, that is um, very much exemplified by General Electric coming here, uh, but it's not just General Electric, obviously. That's just a great, that was a great win for us. Um, there are other companies, I mean, we have uh, Israel coming here to land beachheads in cybersecurity and healthcare uh, and biotech. A lot of European life sciences companies are coming here, uh, or, and, uh, and we have become this uh, international destination, and I think that's great news for the local economy is going to create a lot more jobs, but it also creates opportunities for people who want to work internationally as well. Um, I talk about globalism. I think that places like Boston, because of our intellectual capital, we are one of the great winners in globalism. And it's a certain irony, um, and I think fear I have is that the new president is very much against globalism and, is, and wants to kind of ratchet things back and, and look at, look at um, and, and try to prevent that easy flow of, of capital and people um, and jobs. We lose a lot of jobs in Boston. We have lost so many jobs in Boston to um, India and Eastern Europe and Mexico and what have you, but we've also gained a tremendous amount and far more than we've lost, and that's the nature of effective global trade. But, so we are a big globalism winner here. Um, last, um, last trend is this whole uh, data and artificial intelligence trend is just in the second or third inning. It's not going anywhere. If anything, it's just going to be everywhere. Um, I talked about GE. Why is GE coming here? Uh, well, they want to be near really smart people that can help them create the next generation software for smart industrial machines. Smart industrial machines will um, be very efficient and, um, and help the customers who buy them save a lot of money. So, um, so it's very much, um, uh, we, the idea of con connectivity is only, all our, it's not just about all the people being connected, all the things will soon be connected to, and then the question arises, what happens um, <laughs> uh, when they get hacked? As uh, we learned a few months ago, when um, uh, we, we, we tend to have these, um, I think it was uh, a whole bunch of microwaves and toasters or something uh, help launch a, a big uh, denial of service attack through a, a company just over the border in, in New Hampshire. So anyway, so those are some bigger trends. And so let me just zero in on a couple, a couple of quick career advice strategy things. And I do think that I um, wrote the book so that people would have a bigger, broader sense of what their options were. Um, but uh, I also wanted to delve in a little bit about what makes for good strategy when looking for a job. And so, in my uh, handful of years teaching at Suffolk, I've learned that at least uh, it, the tendency has been for undergraduates uh, not to have a very cogent, um, aggressive plan to pursue a job. Um, what I've noticed is uh, a handful of things. Um, one is that they tend to invest um, a limited amount of time not um, 
it's not that they don't try, but I think they, there's no clear parameters in terms of what, what is the right amount and what's the right effort to, be, to put into this. Um, another thing is they tend to rely on electronic communications uh, and they think that that's the way to go and, um, and that's going to get the job done for them. Uh, they tend not to attend events in their field of interest and, and get out in front of people. Um, and the last thing, and to me, one of the most surprising things is that they don't, they don't ask a lot of people for help. So, um, and, and all these things, this whole idea of having a networking strategy, um, it's all about fighting, about fighting against our human nature. So human natures are to shrink a little bit in this area. It's, it's unknown. We want to shrink back. Of course we'd want to. So um, in the book, I list every single industry and business group uh, as a, uh, and suggest to students that they attend. I also um, um, pose a challenge to my students, which is if they attend a business event and work the room a little and bring back some business cards, I'll give them extra credit. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I haven't gotten a lot. Uh, just, again, it's 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 not what undergrads want to do with their time. But again, it's it's every very much in their interest to do it. Um, so I want them out there for the obvious reason that there is no substitute for presenting yourself to another person face to face and talking to them about who you are and what you want to do. There is no electronic substitute for that anywhere. And so the amount of data that someone takes in when they meet you in person versus when they open up an email is immense. So I always say, of course, you want to have an electronic strategy and you want to do all the smart things you do with LinkedIn. And, and, and LinkedIn is an incredible tool and there's other things to do as well. Um, you want to leverage this, but uh, you want, if you really want to be effective, go out, figure out who you want to meet and go meet them or meet somebody who knows them. Because when that person goes to get your phone call or make a decision about you or about, they're dealing with generally far more information than they would otherwise if it's just an email. And to me, it's, it's terribly old-fashioned, and but I don't think uh, the world is properly set up yet to make electronic communications um, and uh, networking work right for everybody. And it's because it's too easy to dismiss it all, and it's too much noise, uh, and there isn't noise when you go up and you meet somebody in person. Um, uh, I mentioned that students often don't ask for help, and, uh, and I wondered, you know, why, why wouldn't students ask for help when they, you know, when they could use the help and they know the help would, is going to actually make it from point A to point B? Well, I, I thought about it. I guess I figure it's a fear of rejection, right? So they don't, they're afraid that if they ask for help, someone will say, no, I won't help you. And so they don't, you know, I, I say this in my class. I say it every semester. I say, I will, I'm happy to sit down with you um, and go and, and get a cup of coffee and go through my contacts and tell me what you want to do and I will make phone calls for you and I will email if I have appropriate contacts for you. I make that blanket offer. I just sat down yesterday with the first student. The semester's over. One student took me up on the offer. Um, and to some others I may send some emails for, et cetera. But again, so it's that fear of rejection. And I do think that it isn't, again, it's human nature. We, we don't want to get rejected. It hurts to get rejected. But it also behooves us to put rejection uh, in a professional rejection, compartmentalize it in a different place. It's not, you know, and, and almost see it that way. And... Uh, and because generally what I find is that 
the less we're afraid of that rejection, the bolder we are in terms of going after opportunities and the more likely we're going to be successful. And if you're not afraid of failing or someone saying no, then it opens up a whole new avenue for you um, in terms of just rather than rather than asking um, five five people to help you if you ask 15 what to, to give let's say for example ask 15 people if they have contacts for you at various companies or somebody they, they know that you should talk to I don't think students really do that on the undergraduate level I don't think they turn around and say even professor, can you give me five people I can talk to that, that can help me get from this, that can help explain this to me? And one out of 20 students is that way, maybe. And that student usually ends up going pretty far. And again, it's not, it's not that they were necessarily better in the classroom. They're better outside the classroom. And that's another part of the whole career uh, trajectory. Um, and finally, just about the time element, I think that, again, it, we're fighting against human nature. We're all really busy. So if there isn't a, a concrete amount of time that we feel that we're required to spend or that someone's telling us to spend or someone, heaven forbid, is going to give us a grade if we don't spend enough time doing it, then it's only natural that it's going to get a little bit of short shrift. And so you're going to pull back. You may not do as much uh, in terms of your strategy as you would otherwise were it more structured. I do think this is an area where we probably, where there's probably, I don't know uh, if, you know, I'm sure there's seminars and, and the like around this whole area, um, but, but maybe, you know, but maybe, maybe it should be a course where someone gets a grade. Um, who knows? Um, and, maybe, and maybe somewhere it is a course where someone gets a grade for actually executing a career plan and having to bring back business cards and having to bring back a lot of business cards uh, in order to um, pass the course um, and having to draw up a map and a plan for getting from point A to point B. Just a thought. So anyway, um, just a few remarks about the book and then I'll, and I'm done. I hope I didn't talk too long. Uh, so, the, so the book really is, um, it works on two levels. One is that if you're generally curious and you really want to know, like, who are the players in biotech? And I know we have this incredible biotech uh, industry. Who are the players and what are the drugs they're making? And, and um, you know, it's a good quick read and you learn, you learn a bit. Or, you know, likewise, you're talking about startups. Like, what are the crazy startups we have? And, you know, what are they doing? And, and uh, it, it, so it... It's designed to work on that level, um, but ultimately, uh, the goal is for it for for people to stumble across something that they didn't know that they might want to pursue, and that it might set off a light bulb in their heads, and that um, and that they will pursue something that they just never knew. Because generally, it's shocking how incredibly fast moving deep and dynamic this economy is. And uh, it's never been captured in one place, per se, in a book, uh, to my knowledge. This was my, you know, my first attempt to try to deliver it in a way that's useful. Um, but uh, it will shock you. It still shocks me, as someone who's been the business editor for a long time, was paid to know the Boston economy, wrote a book about the Boston economy, and yet, I am still shocked at how much I don't know about the Boston economy. It's an incredibly dynamic place uh, and needs you uh, uh, more than ever. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>